In this video, I'm going to show you how to paint this nice, pretty, delicate peony with watercolors. And the key here is just going to be building up lots and lots of layers. And what I'm going to do first is I'm actually going to apply a little bit of masking fluid to the drawing that I've transferred onto my watercolor paper, and I'm using that silicone applicator because masking fluid will ruin any paintbrush that it comes into contact with, even if you think that you're going to wash it off right away. The problem with it is that it begins to dry as soon as it is exposed to oxygen, and it's going to embrace or wrap itself around every tiny little bristle in your brush. So I never use any kind of brush, even cheap brushes, to apply masking fluid because I just don't want to be constantly buying more brushes. So I found these silicone tools at a local craft store. I think that they're often used for like sculpting clay and things like that, but they work really, really well for masking fluid. And there's, of course, other ways to apply masking fluid as well, but I really like these because they come in different shapes. And so I can do a lot of different things with them. So I'll just speed this up as I finish applying masking fluid. And I'm basically just applying it around the outer edges of some of the petals, not every single petal. But when I look at the photo reference, what I notice is that the petals are very light in value toward the outer edge, and then as they get a little bit closer to the center of the flower where they're anchored, there's obviously more overlapping, there's more shadows, um, and so the values get a little bit darker. And usually when you use masking fluid, a lot of times it's to retain the white of the paper. But I pretty much know that I don't want any part of my peony to be pure white. And so I'm just trying to save a couple areas just to make sure that I don't accidentally make them too dark as I apply my washes and my layers. So I won't need to leave the masking fluid on for the entire painting. I'm basically just going to leave it on until I get to a point where I have everything pretty well defined. And then I'm going to go over those white areas with a very light wash so that they're just a little bit pink. All right, and the colors I'm using are New Gamboge, Windsor Lemon, Scarlet Lake, Permanent Rose, and this Windsor Lemon is just for mixing greens and oranges, and then Phthalo Blue, Ultramarine Blue. And I'll be primarily and mostly using that Scarlet Lake and the Permanent Rose, obviously. And then I just have a few different brushes. I have my mop brush to apply lots of washes, and then I have two sizes of round brushes. And the first thing I'm going to do is just use some water to apply a clear wash onto all the petals. And the first color I'm applying is the Scarlet Lake. And I'm going to keep this really light and watery. And I'm being pretty careful at this point just to keep everything within the bounds of my drawing because I want to keep my background nice and clean and white. And when you use light pencil marks, sometimes it's a little bit hard to see. And especially for me with, you know, the camera kind of being in the way, I can't really get my nose right up to the paper to see everything I'm doing. So I'm being a little bit careful right here. But I basically want this wash over the entire flower, over all of the petals, but it's going to be very, very light, and this is going to be kind of my lightest values that I have. And 
and then I'm adding a little bit of yellow. It doesn't really matter which yellow at this point, but I'm looking for places, as I look at my photo reference, I'm looking for areas that are getting a lot of light so that I can just add a little bit of variation. And in this particular photo reference, it was a little bit difficult to interpret this flower. It's a really nice photograph that I got from pixabay.com, but I usually like to interpret those light areas that are getting a lot of light as, you know, a little bit warmer or more yellow so that I'm not just using two colors to complete this because I want it to have a little bit more variation. So sometimes you just have to wing it if, you know, you really can't see those variations in the photo. But I think it makes the painting look a little more interesting. And now you can see I'm starting to go into this wash. The wash is still pretty wet at this point, which I want it to be because I want all of these colors to merge together and be really soft. But I'm adding just little splashes of permanent rose in areas that maybe are a little bit darker in value that I know I'm going to build up. So I'm just being really careful where I, well, not really careful, but I'm kind of picking and choosing where I place this really bright color and I want it just to be in the areas that I know are going to have a lot of saturation eventually. And I'm also just going over the leaves and the stem right now with just a very light wash of yellow. And I'm not going to do a lot with this until I pretty much finish up the flower, but I'm just blocking it in right now. And typically, I think it's a good idea to, you know, if you're waiting for some part of your painting to dry, like if I'm working on the petals, but I need it to dry before I move on to the next step, then that would be a good opportunity to start working on the stem. So now I've mixed my Scarlet Lake and my Permanent Rose together, and I'm just starting to look for and identify areas where I can start to define the individual petals. And again, I'm just keeping in mind that as the petals get closer to the center of the flower where they're anchored, they're going to get a little bit darker. And because a peony has so many petals, but it's very, very delicate and it's very translucent, there's really not going to be any areas that are very dark. And so most of my shadows are actually going to be created with just really bright, saturated colors. Because the light is able to shine through multiple petal layers and kind of illuminate even the darker areas of the flower. So there's only going to be a few areas where I really apply kind of a shadow color. But right now I want to keep everything pretty light and so I'm not using the most saturated version of these colors because I want to gradually build that up. When you're painting something that's really delicate and translucent like this, that's really important to not try to immediately achieve the boldest, brightest colors or the darkest values. You really need to very judiciously build that up. So that you don't accidentally make something that looks more solid than it really is. And right now I'm kind of alternating between using that mix that's mostly Scarlet Lake, so that's like my warmer red, and using the Permanent Rose. So I'm trying to think of the Scarlet Lake color. That's kind of a coral color. It's kind of an orangish red, so it's my warm red. So I'm looking at areas that are getting a little bit more light, but they have more saturation, and that's where I'm applying the Scarlet Lake color. And then in areas that are receiving a little bit less light, and so they're a little bit cooler in temperature, that's where I'm really applying the permanent rose. Although really my photo reference that I'm using for this flower, it really is like such a magenta. And so you almost could use the permanent rose as your warm color and then use 
that mixed with a little bit of blue for the cooler colors. But that's just kind of a choice that you can make when you do this, how you're going to interpret the colors. So you can see that I am gradually using more concentrated mixes, so the colors are getting more saturated. And if you're not used to just kind of judging how much water is in your mix, it's a good idea just to have a scrap piece of paper next to you and make sure it's the same watercolor paper that you're actually painting on. So maybe, you know, I often will have a watercolor painting that I've messed up and I don't want to, you know, use it for anything. And so it's good to kind of use that paper as scrap paper. And then you can test your mixes before you actually apply them to your watercolor painting. And I think that might be one of the biggest learning curves with watercolor is just kind of getting to know how much water you need in a particular mix in order to get the right value that you're looking for, the right concentration. And you can also see that as I'm applying these more saturated colors, the darker colors, I'm applying them to smaller and smaller areas because I don't want to overwhelm all of those light values that I created because obviously those are there for a reason. When I apply a wash in the beginning of a painting, that's kind of to set the lightest value and it isn't necessarily that I need to completely cover up or obliterate that value. I really want it to show through. And now I've switched over to my really, really small brush so that I can start really getting into the crevices and defining these individual petals a little bit. And the way that I am using this brush I, I know it's hard to see because I can't get my whole workstation on camera, but I'm dipping this brush into my mix, but then I'm actually wiping it off on a paper towel so that I don't have a ton of paint on here, and I'm kind of using a dry brush technique where there's, there's pigment in the brush, but it's not very liquid, and so I can really control where it goes, and I'm using very small marks to kind of blend upward which you can see a little bit right here. And I think the most challenging aspect of painting something like a peony is these really, really small petals in the center because I didn't draw this perfectly. I don't have every single petal the way that it is in the photograph, but I still want it to look, you know, like a peony and very convincing. So the biggest challenge is just to define those petals in the center, but to not, you know, overdo it because it's such a small area. And now I have let this painting dry. I know you didn't see that in the video because I cut it out. But I let it dry and now I'm going and removing all of that masking fluid that I had used on the petals. And I also put a little bit on one of the leaves, which you can kind of see the glare of it right now. But I left that on, not on purpose, but just because I kind of forgot about it. And then when you think that you've got all the masking fluid off, just kind of run your hand over it just to make sure that you didn't miss anything because you don't want to start painting and have that area wet and then suddenly realize you have masking fluid there and try to take it off because your paper will rip. And now what I'm doing is I've gone in and created a very diluted, so there's a lot of water in this mix and it's basically just permanent rose. 
and I'm using that very, very light value just to soften up these edges. And it's not very clear in my video, but you'll notice that when you use masking fluid, you get kind of like a rough, ragged edge, especially, I guess, the way that I apply it with those applicator tools because they're not super precise. But I get kind of a rough, ragged edge. It's actually a little bit thicker than I want it to be, so it's not like a super thin line that I was able to get. And as I said, I don't really want any part of this flower to actually just be white like the paper, especially toward the outer edge, because then, you know, you just kind of see my pencil lines. So I'm just softening that up by creating really diluted mixes and softly blending that down with the rest of the petal. And now I'm mixing up just kind of a violet, so this was just some blue and my permanent rose. I think this was actually my ultramarine blue and my permanent rose and I'm going to there's not going to be very many areas where I apply this mix but just where the very least amount of light is getting so the light source is kind of above and behind this flower I think in the photograph and so this area that's right up front and toward the bottom is going to be getting the least amount of light and so some of these crevices where the petals are receding toward the center of the flower are going to be getting the least light but again I don't want to overdo this because I don't want to make this look like a more solid form than it really is it's still very translucent and delicate so I'm only applying these washes to very very small areas just to give a little bit more definition to some of these petals. And now I'm going back in and softening up some of those white edges. Sometimes, you know, my eye just goes somewhere and I think, oh, I need to take care of this while I'm thinking of it. And so that'll interrupt something that I was already working on, which is what kind of happened here. Another challenge in working with photographs, and this photograph it looks pretty professional, but a lot of areas are kind of blown out and I think look whiter than they probably really did in life. And so sometimes looking at photographs, you just kind of have to interpret that because I don't want my painting to look like a photograph that's a little bit blown out. And so that was part of the challenge in, you know, kind of coming up with this tutorial and, and making this flower look good because you can see in the photo reference that I link below that some of those petals, especially toward the center, they they just look almost completely white and that's just because, you know, whether it was actually the way that they shot the flower or the way that they edit, edited the photograph, some of those petals got a little bit blown out. And I'm getting pretty close to being finished with these petals. What I'm doing here is I'm just going in and looking for areas that need to be a little bit further defined. Where I can add some of these darker values and more saturated mixes. But you can start to see that this flower is coming to life and it's really just a matter of, you know, you apply that big, nice, soft wash at first 
And then from there, you're just looking for areas where you can further define your flower. And it's really important to build up your values and your saturated colors gradually and not try to, you know, get all those values accurate in the first pass because you end up with something that looks a little bit blocky and disjointed. And sometimes, too, it's a matter of being very patient in waiting for something to dry so that when you apply more paint, you don't get unintentional um, bleeding or, you know, sometimes you want to use wet paint over something that is dry so that you can control the lines and control the values a little bit more. So sometimes it's really important just to be able to wait for an area to completely dry. And I would recommend that, you know, in the case of working on a flower, it's a really good idea just to go back and forth between the petals and then, you know, any green areas or leaves and just kind of keep those separate so that while one is drying, you can be working on the other. What I was doing when I was working on this painting was I was basically just taking breaks. So if I was waiting for something in the petals to dry, I would, you know, walk away, do something else, and then come back when it was really dry. But if you're trying to get a painting done in a timely manner, then maybe you would just work on another area of the painting. And now I'm going to start working on the leaves and the way that I build up my leaves might seem a little bit counterintuitive or strange, but one thing that I really like about painting leaves is that they're never just green if you really, really look. And even if you have a photo reference where you don't see a lot of nuance in the leaves, I think that just, you know, observing flowers that you see in real life and just kind of noticing how intricate even the leaves are, it really helps inform the way that you can paint. And so one thing that I really like about leaves is that they often have a lot of warm undertones. And so right now that's what I'm really doing is I'm thinking about building up undertones for these leaves because I don't want them just to be straight green. So I've applied some orange on there. I'm maintaining some yellow where actually there's more light hitting the leaves. And then I let that dry. And now I'm going to apply this nice bluish gr green glaze into the shadow areas of these leaves. So I'm actually going to, anything that is orange right now, I'm going to, um, well, I'm actually going to glaze over the entire leaves and stems, but you're going to see that you can actually see some differentiation between those areas that I left yellow and the ones that I made orange but I'm keeping this mix very watery and transparent so that you can actually see what I had underneath. So this isn't to cover up anything, it's just to basically start tinting it toward a more green color. And this is what is called a glaze. And I did a lot of glazing within the flower too, but I think that this is a more obvious example of what glazing really is. And it's basically just applying a transparent wash over dry paint.
And so the key here is just to have lots of water in that mix and, you know, test it out on another sheet of paper to make sure that you haven't gone too dark or that you don't have too much pigment in that mix because then you'll kind of just obliterate everything underneath of it. And while I'm waiting for that to dry, I'm just kind of working a little bit more on the petals. Sometimes you need to give your eyes a break, especially when you have a lot of petals, lots of details in here. And your eyes can just get kind of fatigued from trying to figure everything out. So sometimes you need to work on something else and just take your mind off of that. And then when you come back and actually look at it, you might see some things that you had missed before. And now if you look back at my leaves and my stem, it really, at this point, even though I'm going to be adding lots of paint, it kind of looks a little bit natural and lifelike even at this point. And now what I'm doing is I'm just kind of using some pure ultramarine blue, and I'm glazing that over all of the darker areas, all the shadowed areas on the leaves. And you can see, you know, I've, I've left this a little bit more concentrated. There's not quite so much water in here. And so it's not really obliterating everything underneath of it, but it's definitely a darker glaze. It's adding a lot more contrast. And then over on that petal on the right hand side, there isn't nearly as much shadow and so I watered down that glaze a lot more. So you can really see it's a lot lighter over there. And then I just realized that I still had some masking fluid so I just rubbed that off a little bit. And now I'm looking for areas on the leaves that are getting a lot of light. And so these areas are going to be more of a yellowish green. They're going to be very bright. And there's not many areas like this on these leaves. They're mostly in shadow. They're being shadowed by the flower, actually. But that one leaf behind has just a little bit of, you know, light hitting it. And also, if you look at the photograph, some of these leaves have almost like a slight halo effect of some green around the uh, shadowed areas. And so I want to make sure to capture that because that is a very subtle thing that you can do just to make things look a little bit more lifelike. If you just look for those really small areas of light that you your eye really doesn't consciously notice when you're looking at a photograph or a painting, but it's something that really helps bring everything together. And so I've added just that very, very light yellowish green around some of those darker areas on the leaves. And now I'm mixing up what is kind of just more of a true green, so just some yellow and some blue. And for now, I'm sticking mostly to my ultramarine blue, but I will use some phthalo blue a little bit later to bring those shadows a little bit more vibrant. And now I'm just applying this very lightly just to start bringing out more of that green effect. But again, at no point do I want to just completely obliterate everything that I've built up underneath. I really want to use that undertone that's very warm to bring these leaves to light and so I'm going to apply any other color pretty lightly on top of all of that. And now I'm mixing up a very dark green so this just has a lot of blue in it and it's very saturated so there's a little less water in the mix and I'm starting to look for areas of texture 
that I can bring out. Looking for all those little veins in the leaves. And I'm basically just painting around those so that those veins appear a little bit lighter. You don't want, almost never I think, are, are the veins of the leaves actually darker than the leaf itself. It's usually the opposite. And so the key is to kind of paint around those. So you can see that these leaves now really, when you look at them, they, they just look green, but we've built up that green from that warm undertone to create a really natural look. And now I've gone into the phthalo blue, so you can kind of see that this is more of like a teal. Phthalo blue tends to lean a little bit toward green instead of, you know, just being pure blue. And I'm going to use this to start defining some of the veins that I see within the shadowed areas of the leaves. So I'm just painting around where those veins should be with this. And I'm using this color just because it's very vibrant and bold. I don't really see this color in the photograph. And a lot of times, honestly, I'm not trying to exactly replicate colors that I see in photographs. I'm just trying to interpret everything. And so you really can't go wrong. But I just wanted to add a little bit of you know color or chroma into those shadowed areas so that they're not real flat but i'm not going to use a lot of that phthalo blue because it's a very very powerful pigment and now i'm using actually a little bit more orange to bring out some of the warmer tones especially that i see toward the top of the stem and a lot of times with leaves as you get to the very outer, you know, pointy end of the leaf, you'll get a little bit of orange, which is what I'm applying right now, because the leaves dry out a little bit toward the end and turn a little bit brown or orange. And now I have put in a whole bunch of permanent rows. And what I'm going to do with this is also very subtle, and I'm actually applying this into the shadowed areas of the leaves, which I've allowed to dry now. So this is a glaze, and I don't have to apply it very lightly because the values in here are so dark. And I know it's really hard to see the impact that this is making, but I'm also using this to kind of define those veins within the shadowed areas, and just to add a little bit of contrast or you know kind of a natural look again because I think that leaves and stems almost always they're never just like green or blue a lot of times they have a lot of warm undertones and I guess you can kind of see the impact of the permanent rose on that leaf that I'm working on or that I just finished up and I think that that just kind of adds a really nice contrast it adds I think a more natural look to the leaf so I'm basically just kind of very lightly and sparingly applying that permanent rose to the leaves. And now I've given my eyes a little bit of a break from all these petals. So I'm gonna just kind of do one more little pass to further define any of these petals that, you know, at this point, they might be there might be multiple petals that are kind of merging together because I haven't figured out exactly how to separate them. And so the last thing I'm doing on this painting is just to kind of go in and see if there's anything that I missed, any petals that need to be separated or defined. But at this point in the painting, there really isn't a whole lot to do. And I think, too, that... Sometimes it's a good idea not to allow yourself to fiddle with a painting. I think with a flower, with something that's really kind of complex, I think a good measure of where you could actually decide to stop is just if you step away from your painting and, you know, give yourself a little break from it, come back and, you know, if it's really reading the way that you want it to, you might want to just stop at that point because it's easy to take things a little bit too far. 
It's easy to fiddle with it and get to a point where you wish that you could go back to an earlier stage. And that's part of the learning process, honestly. It's a little bit of a frustrating part of the learning process because sometimes you'll have a really good painting and the harder you then work on it and continue to be kind of perfectionistic about it, the more likely it is that you're going to take it too far. And so that's frustrating when you know that you had a really nice, beautiful painting, but then you just fiddled it with it to death. And I kind of forgot these little um, bits of leaves up here. So I'm just kind of doing a very light glaze of green on top of those, but I'm not going to do a lot with those because they're very small and they just don't require a lot of attention or detail. And you can definitely see that there's times where I really need to get my nose right up to the painting, and that's basically just to try to identify those little tiny details that I want to bring out. And that is basically it, guys. So I always like to just clean up my area, put things away. I love taking the tape off of my paintings because that's when you really see it for what it is. It's no longer a work in progress. It's done. Pretty happy with it. So here's some up close and personal views of it. And yeah, this was a really interesting and challenging project for me because I'm not really used to working on such delicate little details, but I think that it came off pretty well, and I hope that you enjoy painting your flower.